Hey there everyone, my name is Avilash and welcome back to another episode of Selenium Express and in this video, I'm going to talk about init binders, property editors, converters, validators and also we're going to learn how to use property placeholders in our properties file and also I'm going to tell you how to deal with the type mismatch problem of a Spring MVC application. So a lot of good things in the store but before we begin and before we get started with this particular video let me answer a few of your questions okay. So the first question will be definitely why the length of this particular video is so much it's three hours right so basically I have given a lot of requirements in this particular video so there will be problem solution problem and solution so you'll have a lot of problem and solution attached to this particular video that's why the length of this particular video is pretty much so what you can do is you can get your laptop right now you can stay with me you can start coding with me right now watch the first one hour of this particular video and once you are gets comfortable with this particular concept then understand the requirement and try to solve that requirement by yourself and obviously if you can do it by yourself there is no need to watch that particular section you can happily skip it or or you can watch it in 2x speed there is nobody who is stopping you to watch it in 2x speed okay but I have to complete all these things because I feel this is required okay so the next question will be we already learned about the spring MVC form validator in the last video then why I need to tell you about the form validator concept again in this particular video and the reason is pretty simple guys in spring MVC we can create form validators by using different approach and I told you about one of the approaches which is called the bin validation API and also we have used the Hibernate validator to validate our form fields. But in this video, I'm going to introduce to you the Spring MBC own validation API. So in this video, we are not going to use Hibernate validator, we are not going to use bin validation API, we are going to use Spring's own validation API and we are going to create some validators for our application and this is one of the another important approach and we'll be covering that in this particular video okay so before we get started i know that you have one question still in your mind that is you have been asking me this particular question for the last nine episodes that how many episodes left let me tell you that guys uh, this is going to be the second last video after that, we'll have one last video on the Spring MVC Intermediate series. Okay, after that, we'll be going to the database section. So after this video, we will have one more video where I'm going to talk about the uh, service layer. We'll have uh, the logic for our application, the love calculator application, how this is going to work and all. And also we have to write the logic for the email sending purpose. I have already told you that our application should send emails, right? Whatever the result that we'll be getting from our application, we should be able to send that result to somebody through an email. Also, we need to write the logic for that. And also I'm going to tell you some design patterns in the next video which is pretty pretty crucial and i do not want to skip it and also i will cover some topics like exception handling and all in the next video so after this video that video is going to be the last one and after that we are going to talk about some you know some database stuff we we are going to connect our application with a database and we're going to save our datas right there in our database so pretty much interesting and exciting things are coming up but this video is going to be kind of advanced okay let me tell you that um, if you do not have any prior experience with spring web application you do not know about spring mbc or if you do not know about spring Boot, if you are straight away going with this particular video this is not going to work you can happily skip it i am actually recording this particular video because i have already told you guys that i will not skip anything i'll just give you the explanation step by step line by line and i'll cover everything in detail that's why I am just recording this particular video or uh, watching a three hour video is really challenging but I'm going to give you a sufficient break and obviously you are going to code with me so I'll make sure that you guys will not be bored and let's complete this particular topic and after that we'll have fun and we'll be implementing a lot of logics and also we'll be connecting our application with the database so let's go for that.
Okay, so hope you are excited with this particular video. So first, let's understand about the init binder and property editor and let's understand why we need to use it. Let's go for it. The next thing that I'm going to introduce to you is something called an init binder. So let me open my controller class, which is used by this particular page. Let me do a command set R and let me do star controller and and let me open the registration controller dot Java. Cool. So right now in this controller, I will go all the way to down and right here. Let me write a method here. Let's say public void init binder. Okay, you can give the method name as anything, but I'm giving as init binder because I'm going to annotate this particular method as something called a at init binder annotation. Okay, and let me simply write a log here. Let's say this out. Okay, and let me write something um, inside the init binder method. Cool. So right now, my question to you is going to be when this particular method will be executed. So what I mean by that is, let's say I'm going to click this register button, right? Then obviously the flow will come to registration controller. If I'll go here, the flow will come to this method, right? This is the process registration page. And this particular page is handling the registration success URL, right? We already know that. So right now my question will be, if I'll do a submit or a register where the flow will come, it will come to the init binder method or it will come to here, okay? Let me do a research, okay? Let me put a breakpoint here in the line number 71 and let me put a breakpoint here in the line number 47. And also what I'll do, I'll give a, another breakpoint inside the so registration page, which is handling the class register URL okay so I'll give a breakpoint here as well cool so right now what we'll do I'll just stop the server and I will start my server in debug mode so that I can see how my flow is going right okay my server has started here in debug mode so what I'll do right now I'll go to the main URL first okay I will go to here the main URL and here I don't want to do anything. Now I will hit my register URL slash register URL, right? So then I'm expecting that my flow should come to this method, which is handling the slash register. Now let's see if I am going to hit enter, what is going to happen? And you can see, I am already in my debug perceptives. I'll switch it, I'll, I'll say yes, and see where my flow is. My flow is inside the init binder method that's because I do have a at init binder annotation over here so before my flow before my flow goes to the slash register method which is this one before my flow comes here my flow went to the init binder method okay so this is a point to note it so right now I'll do what I'll do resume my program and now it came to the class register URL. So before this particular method gets executed, before that my init binder method called, okay? And then the class register handler method is getting executed. So let me resume the program again, or I'll do F8. Okay, right now my page loaded, right? Cool. So right now, again, let's say I do have a validation check for edge, right? What is the validation check I made for my edge? So if I'll do command set R, 
if i'll go to dto which is my which is my user registration dto if i'll go here the age should be between 33 and 70 okay so i'll go to the registration page and i'll make sure my age will be 45 okay so rest of the fields are not mandatory and right now let me hit the register again now let's see what is going to happen and again the flow came to the init binder again before the flow should go to slash registration success url or the process user registration handler method the flow went to the init binder okay and then again if i'll do f8 or if i'll resume the program it will go to the next breakpoint and i have my next breakpoint here in the line number 47 so right now my flow came to the registration success url so this is making sure that let me resume the program cool let me go to the uh, page and you can see I already got my result. So the important point to mark here is that my flow is going to my init binder method first and then it is going to the handler method, right? So as you know that in our handler method, we are doing data binding stuff. Let's say here in the registration success, whatever the user enter, we are binding those data with this particular offset, right? So before our data binding happens, just like here, okay, before the data binding happen, we can actually control that. We can control the data binding. We can do whole lot of stuff with this particular init binder, okay? Not only for the data binding, we can use this particular approach or method as the flow is coming here. So before I should move my flow to this methods, if I want to do some pre-processing work, I can do it right here. And the way I can do that, I can do that by, uh, you know, passing in a object reference. I will be using a reference of a class called web data binder. And let me say binder here. So now you can ask me that, hey, Oblast, please give me an example. I don't understand, okay, how we can control the data binding, okay? Okay, so let me give you an example how we can control the data binding. Let's say, uh, if I'll go to the previous page, uh, right now, let's say I'm putting some data here, here, here. And um, let's say I'm giving some email ID, okay? And I have a phone number, I tick some boxes, I choose the gender and I enter register. Okay, it was in debug mode. So what I can do is I can click on no and I'll disable my breakpoint and I'll resume the program. So it will not bug me right now. Okay, cool. So I went to the next page right now and you can see that I have all my data binded here, okay? But if you have a very special requirement, let's say you want, whenever the user is entering all this data, you do not want to bind the user data, okay? Or, or if you do not want to bind the email data, then how are you going to do it, okay? Let's say I do not want to bind this username or this user data, okay? I do not want it to be binded with this object right here. Here you're doing the data binding, right? then how we are going to do it and the way we can do it by using this binder object, right? So let's see here. So if I'll do here binder, which is a reference of web data binder. And if I'll do set disallowed fields. So using this particular method, you can see this binder, this binder, if I'll do control space here, you can see there are a lot of methods here, right? We can control, we can manipulate the things in various way. First of all, let me give you this simple example. Let's say I do not want uh, which, which, or which one I do not want to bind. Let's say this user. And for this user, what is our DTO property? If I'll go to the DTO, for the user, the property name is name. I have copied the name, so I went to the controller method and inside the string i'll give the name property i do not want this object this string object called name to get binded with my dto right so let's see what is going to happen okay so let my server reload the changes and then we are again going to start it in debug mode right let's see let me uh, you know activate all my breakpoints here and now let me go to the registration page and let's say I have some user value. Let's say I'm giving Avilash here. And right now, if I'll do register, this Avilash will not be binded. I'll show you how. 
I will click on yes, I want to switch it. And now let me resume the program. So it will go to the next breakpoint. And right now you can see the flow is inside the process user registration method, which is our registration success URL. Okay, it's again getting timeout. I will just increase the timeout uh, setting, right? But let me hit okay right now. Uh, so if we put your crosser right now inside this DTO object and uh, okay, otherwise we can simply see it in the variable section. We are going to observe this DTO value, right? I'll, op I'll open this DTO object here and now let me check the value for the name. And as you can see, the value I've entered there is Ovilas. It has a value, but right now the value is null, right? So the data binding for the name field didn't happen. That's because, that's because I have controlled it. I have manipulated it. I have changed it right here inside this init binder method. Okay, by using this set, this allowed fields. So before my data binding happens here, okay, before that, I have given instruction to Spring, hey, don't do it. I don't want my name property to be get binded with the user registration DTO property. So that's why the uh, you know value for the name didn't get binded here okay cool so let me go back and let me resume the program and obviously it was timed out previously right so let me do what let me disable it and let me uh, do register again and you can see right now even though I have entered the name here called Avilash if I do register the name is not getting binded here Right now, this is a very good example to get started, but we can do a whole lot of things. We can do, we can play with it. I'll show you an, another example. Let's say right now, let me uh, comment this line. I do not want it. That was just for an example. And now what I want, let me go to the uh, registration page. Let me go back. Now let's say if the user is entering a villa, so if we'll do register, he'll get the value because I removed uh, my uh, init binder disallowed fields from my controller already I have commented it out so now what I want let's say the user should not able to enter a null value here okay the user should he should be entering some value here and otherwise you'll get some uh, validation error that hey this particular field will not be null you'll say Abhilash it is pretty simple we can use some annotation like at not null or at not blank okay so right now previously you have used at not blank annotation let me go to my user registration DTO right now uh, let me use a, another annotation called at not empty okay I will use this annotation and inside this annotation I will give a message and the message will be uh, star cannot be empty okay and if you'll see the not empty annotation it will go into this annotation if I'll zoom it you can see uh, for this not empty annotation we can see the documentation this annotated element must not be null or it should not be empty okay so it will not allow the null value right so we can be sure that okay uh, my name cannot be null or the user need to enter a value right here otherwise the validation will fail and he will be getting this error message in his web page and let me go to my uh, my uh, JSP file which one is that I do not remember it let me say registration reg and I'll get the registration page here and I will go to let me zoom it I will go to here for the name let me change it to name first of all the label and I will add another form input and the path will be name okay let me do command s and let me give a CSS class and that will be error command s and now let me go ahead and test it okay so if I'll go to my registration page again okay and let's say if I'm giving some value here let me give some valid value of a large I'll do enter 
and there is no problem i got a vlas here no problem right now let me not give any value here let me do register and you can see i already have a field error right here the user registration this is my model object or my model attribute and for this the name property has a rejected value and you can see it's not empty uh, dot user registration dot name i already told you these are the key not empty is the annotation user registration is my model attribute and name is the field name is is your dto property name right and similarly there will be uh, some different pattern the spring is going to generate the key and it will look for the values for this particular property inside your property file so whatever there are a lot of formats i already told about it you can have a look on it uh, but i can see my 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 error message is here cannot be empty and if i'll go here did i get it okay i got a i got a form field i got a text box why because i have written input here i should be writing error okay errors okay command s and let me go to my registration page and now first of all let me hit the register url i'll say register enter and uh, let's say first of all i will enter a village here okay and for the s let me enter 33 and do register okay and you can see I'm getting the value right now and if I'll go back if I'll not provide the value for username or the name if I'll do register I'm getting here cannot be empty which is pretty perfect okay this is what I want this is cool right right now let me break this system okay so what we are going to do right now let me go to the user registration DTO first of all whatever the value a user is entering I need to capture it so I will go to my process user registration method which is handling my registration success URL and here first of all whatever the value user is entering I want to log it let's say name value is name value enter by the user is and let me do get that value dto dot get name okay let me get the value whatever the user is entering and let me print it i'll do continue okay and it will reload the changes okay okay let me wrap this thing off let me do something like this okay plus and i want to wrap this with this pattern here why i'm doing it you will understand in a minute okay cool so i have added a logger here right uh, that's pretty nice so right now let me test it out let me go to my registration page okay if i'm giving some value here register okay so whatever i have entered i got here okay now let's say if i am not entering here anything and if i'm doing register then i should not be able to move to the next page as you can see and i am right here inside my registration page and i'm getting this one cannot be empty and if i'll go to my console if i'll see my uh, value here the name value entered by user is there is nothing inside this bars right and now let me break it okay you can see i'm giving some white spaces right now okay and right now if i'm giving some white spaces the not blank annotation will not work because right now the not blank annotation knows that there are some values in it right there are some white spaces and if i'll do register okay you can see I can I'm able to go to the next page okay uh, you can see there is no value right here for the name but if you see the log okay if you see the log you can feel it you can see inside these bars there are some white spaces so the user right now is able to trick my application and I do not want it so let me clear my console for a moment and let me tell you that right now what I want if the user is entering empty spaces just like this and if he is doing register okay before he move to the next page and before the data binding happens okay if i go to the controller before the data binding happens here inside the process user registration method before the things happens here i want to control the flow before it and you know that i can control the flow by using a init binder because before the flow goes here okay i will i can control my flow right here inside this init binder
So Spring says, hey Vilash, if you want to control this type of scenario, then what you can do whenever the user is entering an empty space string, you know that your flow is coming to the init binder method. And right now inside the init binder, you can actually uh, deal with that particular string. Okay. And what I can do, you can write a property editor for the property called, uh, if I'll go to the DTO property for the property called name. Okay. So this name is a string property, right? And I want to trim the string that I'm getting from this particular page. Let's say I'm getting a string with a lot of white spaces. So what I can do, I can go to this controller and I can use a property editor. Okay, the, remember the concept name, property editor. There are a lot of existing property editor that Spring provides and we can use those property editor to control this kind of thing. For an example, right now, the data type is string for us, right? So the name property is a string, right? So right now what I can do, I can write a uh, property editor provided by my Spring called string trimmer editor, okay? So string trimmer editor, editor equal to new string trimmer editor, and it need a Boolean argument. I'll write true here. I'll tell you why I have written true. But first of all, let me go to the string trimmer editor class and let's see what this is. I'm using this trimmer editor, the string trimmer editor to trim my white spaces, whatever I'm getting right here, these white spaces. So what I can do here, I will go to my controller class and I have created my property editor and right now I will register it, okay? And to register this property editor class with my framework, what I can do, I can use this binder reference. So I'll do binder, okay? dot register custom editor okay and i will go with this particular method and the type okay for what type i'm writing this property editor class okay if you see for the user registration detail the type is string this name type is string right so what i'll do i'll write here string dot class okay and what is my field name my i told you my field name is uh, name right for this I am writing the property editor. Let me do command V. And what is my editor? My editor I have created here, the editor object I have created here, right? Editor, let me copy this and paste it right here, okay? That's it. Right now, let's see what is going to happen, okay? Let me start the server again. Okay, my server has started. And if I'll go to my registration page right now, so right now, let me give the edge right here, 33. And let me give some white spaces right now and let me do register and you can see cannot be empty okay so right now the user is not able to trick my application and see here what happened in the log okay now you can see in my log the name value entered by the user is null so how this happened so previously if i was entering some uh, white spaces right here what was happening is it was being printed here, right? While, while the data binding happens also, the white spaces values are going there. But right now what I did, I did control it. I did control it by using this particular string trimmer editor, which is my property editor. I have created an editor. And whenever I give the true value here, what this particular class does, what about the logic written in this particular class, it is going to take the string and if it is empty spaces, right? If it is white spaces, it is going to convert that particular string to null object. It will not let it remain as white space. If it is white space, it is going to convert that object to null. And if the object is getting converted to null, when the data binding happens here with this DTO, whenever the data binding happens, uh, this particular value will be null and the not empty annotation will not allow it, okay? It cannot be empty. Okay, the not empty annotation will allow the white space, but I'm externally converting those white spaces to null and I'm assigning this null value to this and which is getting validated by the not empty annotation, okay? And that's how I'm able to control the thing by using a, you know, using this particular, 
string trimmer editor which is my uh, property editor and the property editor are helping us to control the data binding before the binding happens actually okay. i've just given you an example of property editor okay which is an inbuilt property editor given by spring framework okay so if i will change this one to false okay now what will happen if you will change this to false okay then what will happen then this particular class will only trim the string let's say if the user is entering uh, empty spaces here right then what it will do it will trim it it will remove all those white spaces whatever the white spaces we have given it will just trim it and it will not convert it to a null object but it is going to trim all the white spaces okay i'll just give you an example okay so right now i have already changed it to you know false okay uh, let me right now give some white spaces and do register uh, right now also the user will not be able to go to the next page and my things is working cannot be empty and see here right now my value entered is this you can see all my white spaces get trimmed and my string got empty and if it is a empty string while the data binding if i am binding a empty string to this name object then what will happen i got the not empty annotation here not empty annotation will do that work and it will not allow a empty value to get binded to my name object or this name string object Okay, so right now, let's try to define the property editor. Let's try to understand what it is. So we have seen some examples so far. So right now, I'll just try to give you a definition of property editor. And after that, we are going to see some more uses of that. So right now on your screen, you can see we have a kind of form, right? We have a form here, we have a submit button. And here we need to enter our edge. Imagine that this is your UI. Okay, so in a UI, let's say you have entered the age as 10 and you have hit the submit button. And after that, what basically happens? Then in the server side, we actually capture this 10 and you know that whatever the input that we get from the UI, they all are string object. So in this case, this 10 is also a string object. But hold on, right now we need to store this 10 into a integer objects just imagine that this is your properties inside a dto and right now inside that dto the s property has been defined as integer right now how you are going to store this string inside a integer so pretty simple requirement we have a string object we want to convert it to a integer object of 10 so that we can store this 10 with this particular variable and here to do this conversion, property editor come for rescue. So the property editor is a concept that Spring uses internally to convert this string object to an integer object. So this particular conversion string to integer happening behind the scene by the Spring and the Spring is using the property editor to convert it and this is an auto conversion which is happening so that we are able to store this stain automatically with this particular property called as which is defined as an integer type so this property editor spring is using internally and that's why as a developer we don't need to care much and we don't need to think much about it but hold on there will be scenario in our project where we need to define our own property editor so here spring uses some of his built-in property editor to sort out this particular scenario but what about where we'll have our own requirement? Let's see this picture here. Let's imagine you have a UI and you are asking the user to enter a name. Let's say he is entering Avilas Panigrahi right here and he is entering the submit button. Right now, obviously, we'll be capturing this particular data entered by the user, which is Avilas Panigrahi, and we'll be getting it as a string object. Cool, but this time we have a kind of complex scenario. We have a class called student name and here only we need to store this string object. But the problem is we have two different properties here called first name, last name. So right now we have to convert this particular string object 
to student name object. So we have to convert the string type to student name object, right? So right now we want to capture this particular string called Abhilas Panigrahi and we need to split this particular string and we need to store Abhilas as the first name, Panigrahi as the last name. And this object is the student name object, this particular class object. So now how this conversion will happen? The string type to our own custom type. And again, here the property editor comes for rescue. So here we need to convert the string type to our own custom type because Spring cannot automatically do it. There is no default property editor which is available which can do this stuff for us. So pretty simple concept, right? Property editor is going to help us to convert the string type to our own custom type because the user is going to enter something with a very simple format. We do not want the user to see the complex thing. So we'll just give him a text box. Hey, enter your name. But right now, once he entered his name, we will take his data and then we'll set the user data with our custom object and then we're going to play with this particular object. Here is a simple scenario you can understand. So let's say right now, I want to store this object into our database, okay? Let's say I have a table called student profile. I have first name and last name, two columns in my database, and I can simply store this particular object to my database, and I'll get a record here called Avilas Panigrahi. So all these things are complex thing, but the end point is, my user has given me a data just like this as a string format. Then I have taken this data, I have used a property editor to convert this particular data and then I can do anything with this particular object. I can play with this object, I can do any operation or I can simply save this particular object to my database, okay? So here comes the property editor for the rescue. So the property editor is basically helping us to convert one data type to another. So using the property editor, I can convert the string object to my custom object and also it works in a either way. I can convert the custom object to a string object type, okay? And that's particularly the uses of property editors. So whatever the example that I have given you, with this I can come up with a definition of property editor that the spring uses the property editors to convert the string to object type, just like string to object type and also object type to string type, reverse, right? Object type to string type. So basically, uh, the string to object type, I have shown you the example of a saving operation. So basically, we have taken the data from the user and then we have converted the user data to a custom object type. Also, the object type to string type, when this will be useful during a page load. So you remember the formatter concept, right? I have given you a similar example in the formatter concept. Let's say we have this object right now and I want to display this particular object into my web form. So during the page load, I need to convert this object to a string type so that I can show it in my web page. And I can achieve all this using the property editor, which is going to convert my object from string to my custom object type and also from the custom object type to the string type. That's pretty simple, nothing fancy. Remember one word, conversion, and I can actually edit a property. So the property editors are helping us to edit the properties. Okay, so one more important thing here. So in the code earlier, I have shown you the example of a init binder. This is basically the code snippet that we have seen earlier. So right now here you can see we are using something called a web data binder. Fill the name, web data binder. This is a class and you know what, this class as the name suggests to you, this is going to help you for the data binding. For the default data binding, this particular class is kind of responsible. So in simple word, if I want to define this particular class, the binder that is responsible for setting the properties value onto a target object. And if I make it more simpler, the work of this particular class is setting the form values or setting the form fields into the bean. So you're capturing your inputs from a form, then you are setting all those inputs 
to your respective DTO properties or to respective beans. And for all this, this particular class is responsible web data binder. Probably this class is doing the magic. And now the next question is, how can we have the access for this particular class? We can have the access for this particular class by using a init binder. So an init binder method initialize the web data binder. So who is creating the object for this? Obviously the framework. And how we can have a access for this particular object? Whenever we are defining this particular init binder over this particular method, this particular annotation is going to help us to initialize this particular class called web data binder. And once we have access to the web data binder object, which is binder, then with this binder object, we can register our custom editor. Earlier, we are trying to edit the name properties and to edit the name properties, we have taken the help of string trimmer editor. And this particular trimmer does what? We had a string with number of white spaces. So this particular trimmer trim all these things and converted this particular object to a null object, okay? And once we have this null object, we're telling the binder, dude, here is our editor class. Whatever the result you got, which is null in this particular case, please bind it with this particular property called name. So previously we have this white spaces for this name property and right now we have converted that particular property to null and again we are assigning it to the name. So before the data binding happened, we are actually letting the web data binder know that, hey dude, this is the property we want to edit and the web data binder is helping us to do that for us because this is the class which is responsible for the data binding. So before the data binding happened, we are just letting this particular binder class know that, okay, we are changing the name property if we have white spaces. So with the binder class, we can actually register the custom editors. Also, we can register the validators. I'll tell you how to register the validators using this particular binder class. And also we can let the web data binder class know about the required properties. Let's say in our form, there are five text boxes which are mandatory. Okay, we can let the web data binder know that, okay, these properties are required. And also we can let the web data binder know about the allowed and disallowed fields just in case we do not want to allow some field or just in case we only want to allow five fields or three fields of a particular form. We can achieve it just like this binder.set allowed fields or set disallowed fields and we can put the form properties name right here inside the parenthesis and the rest web data binder is going to take care because this is the class which is going to help us for the web data binding. Okay, so the web data binder can help us to register all these things with this particular reference called binder. But one of the most important thing that we are learning right now is the custom editor. And right here, we are using the string trimmer editor and this is a built-in property editor provided by the spring, okay? So we have built-in property editors and also if we want for our custom needs, at that time, we need to create our own custom editors. But right now, let's take into the built-in editors just like string trimmer editor. Not only the string trimmer editor, Spring provides us a lot of built-in editors. So I'm going to show you some of the property editors which is already available inside the Spring framework. So right now, I'm inside the Spring documentation and if we go all the way to down, you can see there are a lot of property editors provided by the Spring framework. Let me zoom it. Uh, just like the class editor, the custom Boolean editor, the date editor, this editor I'm going to show you. Okay, let me let me give you an example using this particular built-in editor called custom date editor. But right now the one that we have used, we have used the string trimmer editor. 
okay and just like that we have the url editor you can go ahead and you can use all these particular editors if you want but hold on right <laughs> let us go step by step might be there is no need to use all these editors but we should be aware what is a property editor and how to use it uh, okay so as we are right now continuing with a string trimmer editor and i know you have a kind of good hold that what is this particular string trimmer editor is doing but let's try to debug our code right now that we have written so far and let's understand it better and let's have a complete clarity on this particular editor so if you understand one or two or three editors then i'm pretty happy then i can go ahead and can create my own custom editor but before that let's have some more clarity on the string trimmer editor and let's back to our ide now Okay guys, so right now, if you have any doubt on this concept, okay, might be if you are not able to understand how this string trimmer editor is actually working and what is this true and false is working, what is actually happening behind the scene, the only thing you can do is you can do debugging. I'm damn sure that you already understood it, but in case there are some doubt what you can do it, let me quickly do it. Let me quickly show uh, it to you. That if you have any confusion how you're going to clarify it let me go to my breakpoint and let me remove all this black point let me control a and let me do remove all and now what I'll do I will only give a breakpoint in the line number 49 so that I can see the value right here in my DTO object after the data binding, what are the value I'm getting right here? I can observe that. My breakpoint is disabled right now. Let me enable this. And also let me give a breakpoint in the line number 77. Okay. And let me hit the URL from the home page. Let's say, let me go to the register. Okay. First of all, let me disable it for a moment. Otherwise, the init binder method will be get called. Uh, register. Okay. The page loads. Is I'll give 20, uh, 33 and the name let's say I am only giving some white space here okay and if you remember in my controller okay here the string trimmer editor is set to false that means it will only going to trim the white spaces entered right here so I have given a breakpoint here in the line number 49 let me activate the breakpoint and uh, let me uh, do a register and let me check the value okay so then whatever the stream that I'm getting for my name field let me trim that using this so f6 f6 okay then f8 I'll do f8 to go to the next breakpoint and now if you see here inside my process user registration method if I put my cursor here in my DTO you can see uh, the field for name this is an empty string right now and if you open this uh, value i can see value is an empty string right there is nothing inside this care array so this confirms that this particular uh, you know string timer editor will just stream and convert your string to an empty string if you are going to put it as a false value inside the argument let me resume my program for now okay and let me change this to true let me do command s and let me check again what is going to happen if i'm going to hit my request again okay and right now let me hit the same url my i have some empty spaces here okay and right now let me hit register again okay now let's see what this particular class is doing let's let's do f8 it will directly go to the next breakpoint right now the string trimmer class does it work and right now my flow is here and again if you're going to see the name right now see Last time it was empty string, right? There was two inverted quote right here. But right now the value is null, which confirms that this particular stream trimmer class, this particular stream trimmer editor class is converting a string with white spaces as a null object and it is setting the null value to this name. That's why during the data binding, uh, what happened is with my name property, 
and the value which is got binded here is null. I hope the concept is clear. And right now, let me resume the program. And let me do one more thing, one last thing, okay? So what if, if I'll not use this, okay? If I will comment this, and if I will comment this, uh, the property editor class inside the init binder method, then what is going to happen? Just have a look. So after you comment both this line, it will go to the registration page. And again, if you're going to give some empty, and if you're going to hit register, now it came directly to the process user registration page because in my init binder, I think I have commented out everything, right? And there is no breakpoint in the line number 75. That's why the flow directly came to my process user registration page. And, and if you'll put your cursor here, you can see the name field right now. These are some empty spaces, isn't it? These are some empty spaces provided here inside the invited comma. And you can see this is a string containing the white spaces or the blank spaces. So inside this DTO, if you'll go inside this, this name field will be containing the empty spaces, right? And if it will be having the empty spaces, then the not empty will not work as the not empty annotation allows the empty spaces, right? Only when this name will be containing a null value or a empty string, at that time only, the not empty can do it work, okay? And can validate our string, okay? So in this scenario, our validation fails that's because if in our controller right now, whenever the data binding happens for the name field, we do not have an empty string. We have a string, a valid string, which has the empty spaces by the user. Okay. Uh, hopefully it makes sense right now. So whenever you need more clarity, keep debugging, keep seeing the values so that uh, your confusion will be yet clear. All right, so right now, I want to introduce to you guys with some built-in property editors. And that's why I have created a new project here called Init Binder Concepts. And I do not want to mess up a lot of things with this particular project because my goal is to make it a full flex working project so that I can deploy it in a live server. That's why I have created a new project just to make a new scenario right here. So as you can see, we have a build page and we have four different text boxes. So first of all, let me actually fill all these details and let me see what is actually going on right here. Okay, so as you can see right now, I have already filled in all the details of this particular form and look at the date field right here. I'm filling in 06, which is my month, then 31st, which is the date of this current month and then the year. So following the US debt standard and right now, let me hit pay bill. Okay, so once I hit pay bill, I got the statement here, bill against the credit card number this towards the amount 20 USD generated on the date, whatever the date that I have entered, okay? So this is a very simple project that I have created just to make you understand about the built-in property editors. So right now, let's see the back end of this particular project. And I only want you to focus on the DTO this particular build page is using. So let me go to this init binder concepts and let me go to source main Java. And first of all, let me go to the controller. I have only one controller right here called test controller. And you can see this is the last request. This is actually loading my build page, which is this one. And now, let me go to the DTO, this build DTO, which is actually used by my page, okay, my web page. I just want you to focus on the data types that I'm using right here for my properties. So to store the amount, I'm using the big decimal. To store the currency, which is this one, USD. To store this USD, I am using the currency right here. To store the date, I'm using debt here and obviously for credit card, I have a credit card class created right here having the first four digits, second four digits, third four digits and with the last four digits properties. Okay, so you can see I am giving an input just like this and behind the scene, I'm actually formatting this and storing all these digits with 
all these properties as I have discussed to you in the last tutorial whenever I was discussing the formatter concept. Okay, so right now it's time to give you the first requirement and let's see how we are going to solve it. So now have a look on this date field. So we have a data type here called date. And if you're going to our web page, you can see I am giving the date as in this format 06 31st 2020. So this is basically the US standard and most probably some different countries has its own date format. Okay, for example, in India, we write the date first, followed by the month and followed by the year. And right now, let me hit the pay bill button here. And as you can see, my data binding also happens well. But right now, let me change the requirement a little. Let's say I do not want to enter. Let me go back. I do not want to enter the date in this format. Rather, I want to have a pattern just like this 31st then the month which is May and then again a dash or a hyphen and after that I want to write my year here and right now let's say if I'm going to do pay bill let's see whether my data binding is successful and as you can see right now we are kind of getting a error here and if we are going to read this particular error this is pretty self-explanatory you can see fail to convert the property value for the type java.lang.string to the type java.util.date so in the input we are giving a string but right now spring is not able to convert this particular date to the date format which is there in our DTO okay with this property my data binding is not happening because I have changed the format right here. So when we are actually receiving this type of format from the user, we need to let Spring know about it. That hey, if you are getting a format just like this, then we need to explicitly handle it and we can do it by using a property editor. Let me tell you how. So if I'll go to the test controller.java right now, here, obviously, I want to control the data binding. I want to change that format. So what I can do, I need to write a web data binder. I need a web data binder right here. So let me zoom it first. Let me give some white spaces right here. And now inside this test controller.java public void init binder. I will accept the web data binder right here because this is the guy who is doing my data binding and I want to let this guy know about the format I'm accepting. So web data binder binder and to initialize this particular web data binder, I will annotate this class with a init binder annotation. And right now using a property editor, I am going to change the pattern to this. Okay, so how I'm going to do it. So this is a string, right? So what I can do here, I'll go to the test controller. Right now here, I will be needing a property editor called custom date editor. Okay, so custom date editor, custom date editor equal to new custom date editor. And what it is asking a date format and allow empty. Uh, let's say I want to allow empty. So let me make it true. And now it is needing a date format. So how to create a date format in Java? I can use simple date format, uh, date format equal to new simple date format. And here I can give my format. So first I'll be accepting the day, so DD, and then dash MM, and then YYYY. Okay, this is gonna be my format, isn't it? If you are going to match this with this, this is exactly the format that I'm writing here. Cool, so right now my date format object is created. So let me copy this and let me paste it inside this date format. And this particular editor is going to help us to convert the user input date to this particular format, okay? So to do that, again, I'm going to do what? I'm going to register 
this particular editor with my web data binder with this guy so I'll say binder dot register custom editor and the type is obviously date date dot class because I am writing it for the property called date here and then my property name is date so let me copy this I'm only trying to format this particular date okay so what I'm gonna do here I can give a property here the property name here called date and right here I need to give my property editor instance the one that I have created here for my date editor I'm going to register it with the web data binder okay and that's it let me do command s and let me wait till my server reload the changes okay it's done right now so I can go to my web page and now let me hit pay bill again and let me see whether my data binding is happening fine this time and boom as you can see right now it is accepting the date right here okay so the data binding is working good but there is one problem still I need to fix see the month it is saying Jan but if you see here I'm actually entering 06 which is actually the month for the June even if I'm making it 02 here pay bill still it is saying Jan right so the month is not working why if I'll go to my controller and if I'll go to my init binder method here the mm I've written in small let me make it caps let me do command s and let me test it again so now let me go to the web page and let me go here let me make it 31st 06 which stands for June pay bill now it is saying July why it is saying July that's because we do not have a 31st day in the month of June so if I'll make it 30 and if I'll do pay bill now it is going to work fine and you can see Tuesday June let me try with another date let's say 31st uh, 12 2020 and you can see right now saying December 31st 2020 so now it started working good so we are all set right now Okay, so right now, let me give you an, another example of a built-in property editor. So as you can see, again, I'm on my bill screen. I have entered the credit card number. And let's say I want to enter some amount as $20,000. So much money, man, $20,000. And uh, you can see right now in my DTO, in my bill DTO, as you can see, uh, the amount I have defined as the big decimal. So big decimal is pretty perfect for transaction and for payment okay if you want to store you can use decimal or big decimal I prefer big decimal It's kind of the big brother of the decimal this is pretty special I'm going to talk about it sometime later but let me come back to our concept and let me go to the tasting and let's say the amount is 20,000 and the currency is 20,000 USD let me say USD and the date let me give as 31st 2020 okay and let me hit pay bill nothing happens everything works pretty good so the card number is this the amount is 20,000 USD and it's generated on this particular date this works pretty good but right now I do have a very specific requirement let's say whenever there will be a lot of money uh, you know we always confuse even I always confuse so what I want I want to give some convenience to the user whenever they are entering the amount Let's say I want my user to enter the amount just like this 20,000 that means 20 comma then triple zero then double zero after the dot okay so I want to have a comma after 20. So right now if you're seeing this particular amount this is pretty user friendly isn't it 20,000 this looks pretty good but right now the problem will arise whenever you are going to hit the pay bill and you can see a problem here fail to convert property value type to java dot lang the string which is this one is a string and it is not able to convert to the required type java.math.bigdecimal which is this type so the data binding again failed here and again right now as I am accepting my amount with my custom pattern I need to convert this particular string to a big decimal object 
by letting Spring know the special format that I'm using right here. And again, to do that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the testcontroller.java and right here, I am going to register a custom editor for the amount field. And this was for the date, okay? Editor for the date field. Okay, so right now let me work on this. So to register a custom number format, what I'm gonna do, I am going to use a built-in editor of Spring called number format editor. So there is no number format editor here. Might be I do not know the concept. <laughs> Probably the class name is custom number format editor. Yeah, there you go. Custom number editor. This is the editor that I'm going to use. Custom number editor, editor equal to new custom number editor. And here I'm going to register my custom number format. Okay. So right now, if you we'll go to this particular class, you can see it is extending to the property editor support. Uh, just make sure that this is a property editor. Okay. And if I close this, and if I'll go to the custom debt editor class also, you can see the custom debt editor is also extending to the property editor support. And if I'm going to go to the project structure, if you're going to hit this link to editor, you can see all these custom editors are there inside a package called property editors. Okay, so Spring has this package called property editors and inside this property editor it has all its property editor. So, so far we have used the string trimmer editor and we have also used the custom date editor and right now I'm using the custom number editor. Okay, so now let's use this editor. So let me close this. Let me minimize this. Okay, so I have created the instance of the custom number editor and right now I need to define a format. Okay, and to define a format what I can do, there is a class called number formatter probably number formatter coming from java.txt use this abstract class and I can say number format equal to new decimal number format. And the decimal number format I want to accept is what if I'll go here, the format that I accept is just like this first two digits, then comma, then again three digits, then dot, then zero zero. So what I can do, I can go to the test controller again. And here for the decimal format, I can write two digits, comma, three digits, dot, zero zero. This is going to be my format. And right now, I'm going to copy this number format. And I want to register this particular number format with this custom number editor and allow empty. I'll say, okay, allow the empty, no problem. And right now to get rid of this particular error, I can define this particular custom editor I'm using for the big decimal. Okay, big decimal dot class. That's cool. So right now the error is gone. So I've created a custom number editor for my big decimal classes or for my big decimal type. And here I'm going to accept the number format as this. And I'm also going to accept the null values. Okay, so I'm all set and I've defined my custom number format. And the only thing I need to do, I need to register this custom number editor with the binder. So I can say a binder dot register custom editor. And the required type is what? The type is obviously big decimal. So let me copy this. And let me go to my controller and let me say big decimal dot class. And the field is what? If I'll go to the DTO again, the field is amount. Let me copy this and let me paste it right here. And the property editor instance that I've created right here is editor. So let me copy this and paste it right here. And there you go. I'm all set. Let me hit command set F and there you go. So right now let's test if I can accept a number in this particular format. Okay. Because right now I have defined a property editor which is going to convert my string, which is this, to a decimal object. So let me hit pay bill. And now there you can see the amount entered by the user is 20,000 US dollar right now. The user has entered in his convenience way, which is this. And when we hit pay bill, the 20,000, which was a string, 
it has been converted to the big decimal type okay so the data binding happened pretty fine and obviously the 20,000 it is binded to this amount which is a big decimal type so the conversion happened here is string to big decimal and all happened behind the scene and we have just used a number format editor which is a property editor in this particular case So I can wrap up this particular section right now, but I know you might have question that uh, okay, Avilash, if string trimmer editor, this is spring trimmer providing this particular property editor for us, can we create our own property editor? Uh, okay, so let me show you one more thing. If you'll go to the string trimmer editor, as I told you, this is a special property editor class. The way I know is the property editor class because this is extending to the property editor support class. And if you want to create your own property editor, you need to extend this particular class so that spring can know that, okay, so this is his own property editor class. So there is nothing fancy the spring framework people did here. This is pretty simple. They have created a class. They have extended to the property editor support class. And then if you see here, if you go down, there is a method called set as text and this set as text method, they have overridden it and they have written the logic for the string trimmer class right here. Exactly same thing you can do and without any hesitation, the things will work fine. Okay, let me, let me show you a simple example. Let me close this up. Inside this user registration page, if a user is going to enter something like, let's say Avilash here, okay? And if he is doing register, so this Avilash, right? This particular string, you should be converting that particular string to all upper cases, okay? Then how are you going to do it? So do you get the scenario? So the user will be entering the value here. Whatever the value he has entered, you need to tag that particular value. And in your user registration controller, Whenever the data binding happens here, to this DTO first name field, here you need to convert that particular string to all upper cases, and then you need to bind that to this particular uh, to this particular object. Right. So you need to write your own property editor. For an example, let's say you need to write your own property editor before the flow comes here for the data binding inside the init binder method, you need to write a property editor so that you can capture that particular value. You can capture this particular value and then you need to send that particular value to your DTO, right? So before the flow comes here, before the data binding happens, you need to convert the string to the uppercase so that for my user registration DTO name property, I can bind the conversion value. So what I can do right now, let me collapse everything. Let me go to Java resources, source main Java, and uh, I can go to actually the uh, package explorer. Let me collapse everything again. I can open the spring love calculators, go to source main Java, and here I can create a new class. And let me keep this particular class inside com.seleniumexpress.lc. Uh, LC, then I can create a new package called property dash editor okay i cannot give a dash in package name property editor i can say for the package name 
and here I'll create a new class let's say name property editor okay this is the property editor I'm creating to convert my name field value to upper cases right and for that I need a super class let's say the class name will be property editor support okay the property editor support class I need to extend so that I can override the set as text method where I can write my logic okay so let me create this class inside the property editor package right here name property editor and right now uh, my name property editor class is extending to the property editor support cool so here I don't need to do anything I'll just override a method called set as text so you can do what you can go to source and you can go to override implement methods and you need to override the not the get as text the set as text let's go down 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 and here it is right set as text this method I want to override let's do ok and this is the method and right now whatever the string the user is going to enter I will get that string here let's say the user is entering the string for name field is Abhilash I will be getting this Abhilash right here right here by this particular text so what I can do right now I can just do text dot to uppercase to uppercase and I will convert it as a new string let's say uh, string my converted string value okay equal to and I got that string and once I have done doing operation over the string that I'm getting let's say I'm converting to uppercase and I'll get my uppercase string value right here I will make sure this particular value right now will go to my DTO right so to make it happen what I'll do there is a, another method called set edge I think set value or something yes set value right again this particular method is coming from property editor support you need to use this method and here you need to pass this string object let me copy this and let me paste it over here and that's it you are done let me do command s to save this particular file and I can do a command a control shift f to format everything let's do a command s to save everything and that's it so I have created my own property editor here called name property editor and right now let's make use of this name property editor just like I did here inside the registration controller for string trimmer editor right so I have my own property editor class right now so what I can do I can create the object for my property editor class so name property editor let me say name editor equal to name property editor and now I'll do binder which is my web data binder object right and I'll do binder dot register custom editor and the required type is again string dot class the field name will be name and the property editor that I've created is name editor let me copy this and let me paste it again and there you go let me save this particular class and let me give a breakpoint here in the line number 81 and let me give a breakpoint here in the line number 50 is already there let me activate the breakpoints and let me check what is going to happen whenever I'm going to hit the submit button right now I've already given the last value here let me hit the submit or the register let me do yes let me switch the perceptives and now in the line number 81 inside the init binder method my flow is here right so now let me execute okay I can do one more work let me go to let me go to the name property editor class and let me give a another breakpoint inside the set as text method this method I have written right let me give a breakpoint here in the line number 10 and now let me go back okay my flow is here inside the init binder method of the registration controller class and right now let me do f6 okay and now let me do f6 again and let me do resume so that it will go to the next breakpoint and as you can see right now it came to the name property editor class which is my default property editor class and here obviously for the text I will be getting a village whatever I have entered here and then again if I'll do f6 here you can see 
for this converted value i am getting abhilash this is what i have done right here if you'll do a control shift i you can see the value that i'm getting is abhilash here okay and then i'm setting this particular value whatever i got here to my set value method and using the set value method i can actually set my custom object that i have created right here okay so let me do f6 again or i can do f8 or resume this particular program so that it will go to the next breakpoint which is my process user registration method again keep your cursor here inside the dto and if you'll see the name here you can see it it is avilas right now with all caps right so there is no problem right now you can resume this particular application and right now you should be getting your success page again the timeout issue i'm going to fix it soon i'm going to fix it soon but for now let me disable all my breakpoints let me go to the other perceptives and now what i can do if i'll do register uh, let me do register again i'm going to the next page and the value here is all caps okay so before you go ahead and try this example right here i just want to show you one more thing and okay this is the challenge for you right now you are going to code whatever i taught you right you are going to code the same thing and look uh, something right here in your screen uh, so you can see uh, the property editor that i have created right here uh, i am passing the string dot class and also i am passing the property name right here which is name in this case and then i'm passing the editor name right so what you need to do you need to try the same example actually for the register custom editor we do have some overloaded methods right you can test that you can do binder dot hit control space and observe the method that we have for register custom editor you can see uh, if we if we do not pass the property name right here okay if you do not write name here still our code is going to work fine because we do have a overloaded method available for register custom editor so you need to try the same thing okay do not pass the property name here which is name in this case and try to see what is the result that you are getting and try to give a valid explanation in the comment section and whoever will give me the valid explanation i'm going to pin his answer i'm or i'm going to pin her answer um so that everybody can see that and they can learn from it so do not forget to comment your findings in the comment section. Try this example right now. Okay, so right now I know you are very much excited to create some of your own property editors. Right now you know the concept that how to create a property editor, right? So let me give you some requirements right now. And that's why, again, I have switched to the previous project. So as you can see right now, I am here inside the init binder concepts project. And now the requirement that I want to give you is going to be, let's say uh, the amount the user is entering $20,000. Okay, this is the amount he need to pay. He has entered the credit card bill and he has entered a date and let's say he is giving a currency let's say usd okay that's pretty fine if i'll do pay bill okay the binding is happening fine and i'm getting here usd no problem that's good but i have a very specific requirement here i cannot tell the user that hey just enter the usd always in later you can also use usd just like this or you can just use inr just like this okay and if i go to hit pay bill button right now see what happened now again the conversion failed and it is saying right now the string cannot be converted to the currency okay so if you remember for this for this field called currency if i'm going to hit the dto if i'm going to pull up the bill dto you can see for the type currency, we have used a data type called currency, okay? So currency is a class, is a special class present in java.util package. So I'm going to give you a little bit of idea on this class called currency so that we can implement our thoughts and our concepts here in our project. So the problem here is whenever the user is giving the small letter as the currency, let's say USD or AUD, 
probably for Australian currency. And if it is hitting pay bill, it's not working. But if I'm going to use AUD in caps, pay bill is working good. So how to fix it? So before fixing this, we need to have some idea that how this currency class work, okay? How this data type currency work. So let me open a class in my testing package. I have already created a currency demo class and let's see uh, some fundamentals about this particular currency class. I know few of you might be familiar with this currency class, but as I always say, we all need to be in the same page before we go ahead and I do not care if you already know it, okay? You can skip it. <laughs> so you can always skip it or forward it, but, but I do not want anybody to miss this concept on this particular class called currency. First of all, tell me how we can create a currency object, okay? So if I say currency, which is coming from java.util, currency equal to new currency. This is how we need to create the object. But as you can see, if I'm going to do new currency, I do not have a constructor here. So how I'm going to create the currency class object. So remember that if you want to create the currency class object in Java, so you can use the get instance methods. So it might be it is following the singleton design pattern and you can see it, it has static methods called get instance and a get instance method here. This get instance method accepting the currency code or this get instance method is accepting the locale. So let me use this currency code, uh, this particular method get instance, and let me use this particular method to create the currency object. Let me provide the currency code here, and let me say USD in small letter, and let me see whether I'm able to create the currency class object, okay? So let me do this out, currency. Okay, so now let me run this. And I should be getting an exception. Yep, there we go. Illegal argument exception. So this exception does mean that in the argument, we have passed the USD in small letter. So we have to pass it just like this, USD. And right now, if I'm going to run it, it is going to run fine. USD, as you can see. Okay, I'm printing the currency right here. And it is just giving me the currency code that I have used while I was creating the currency class object. So this is the reason whenever I'm entering uh, the AUD or INR or USD in small letter, I cannot, I cannot go to the next page and my data binding is failing, okay? So I can actually convert this small USD to caps USD to shut out this particular problem or to fix this particular problem. But before we go ahead, let me give you some more example on this currency class and I'm going to use it in my project soon. So let's say I'm giving USD in caps and I'm going to use this currency object right here and I'll do dot get symbol. And if I'm going to run this, you can see I'm getting the dollar symbol right here which is for the USD country code, okay? And similarly, I can use various method of currency class, just like display, I can say get display name, okay? And if I'm going to run it, you can see it is saying US dollar. The USD is stands for the US dollar. Just like that, I can give JPY. JPY is for yen, it's the Japanese currency. So if I'm going to run it, you can see it is saying Japanese yen. Yen is the currency for the Japan. Cool, so these are the various methods that we can use for the currency class. And one last thing I want to tell you about the currency class, you can also use the get instance method, the other get instance method to create the currency object, just like you can provide a locale here. So I can say locale dot uh, Canada, China, you know, you can see all this uh, different locale here. I can, I can say local.us or UK, I can say. And I can print another sys out here. And I can say currency dot, let me say get country, uh, get currency code. Okay, so that I will get the currency code for UK. So if I'll do run this particular program, you can see British pound, 
Okay, that's because I am printing the display name. For display name, I'm getting British pound and GBP is actually the currency code for the UK. Okay, so if I do not know the currency code, I can use the local and from this local, I can create the currency object and I can use the get currency code to get the currency code of a particular local just like this GBP. Okay, so if I will comment this line instead of local.uk, I can also provide GBP here and I can run this particular program and it is going to work pretty fine. And you can see British pound it is giving this because I am printing the currency dot get display name. Cool. So let me close this class right now and let me go back to this particular problem and let me solve this particular problem. Okay. So now let me create a custom currency editor to convert this USD to uppercase. I'm going to create a new property editor and I'm going to say it as my currency editor and this is going to extend to property editor support and I'm going to keep it with a package called property editor and I'm going to hit finish here and once I get my currency editor right here I'm going to override the set as text method and right here I'm going to tag this text I'm going to convert it to the uppercase and I'm going to set this to set value method and that's it and my currency editor is ready now let me register my currency editor to register it I'll go to my controller class which is test controller and inside the test controller I'll go to my init binder method so let me give some white spaces let me bring this up and here let me register a custom editor for currency. Cool, so my server reload the changes. So let me test my currency editor is working or not. Let me go to the testing. So here, let me give a fake credit card number okay and mark that the currency that i am giving here is usd in all small but previously it was not working it was not binding now let me hit pay bill and something happened so it is again saying failed to convert property from string to currency what happened here so let me go to my currency editor again so okay okay i got it i got it because i'm just directly converting the text to uppercase this doesn't make sense so what I'm going to do here I am going to say currency I want to convert the currency class string right I need to create a new currency object so let's say currency dot get instance and I'm going to use this currency code I'm going to accept the currency code here but the code that I'm going to accept I'm going to copy this I'm going to cut it actually and I'm going to paste it here so I'm going to accept the text. Let's say I'm getting the text in USD, small letter, and I'm going to convert that small letter to all uppercase. And once it happened, I'm going to create a new currency object. So I'll say currency, currency here equal to, and my currency object got created here. And once it's done, I'm going to set this currency object inside the set value method. Okay, command A, command shift F to format it and hopefully my currency editor is going to work fine right now. So let me test it out. So now let's again go to the app and let me hit the pay bill button right now. But you can see I have USD in all small. This is my currency code and let me hit pay bill. And there we go, it's working good, right? Right now, as we have entered USD in small letter, but still the binding happens fine and we are getting USD here, which is our country code. So if I'm going to pull in this particular page, which is my result page, let me open my result page actually. Let me show you the result page here. And here actually I'm printing all the values inserted by the user. And you can see buildDTO.currency I'm printing. And this is actually printing the currency object. 
and you already know that whenever we are printing the currency object that is actually printing the currency code which is happening in this particular case whenever I'm printing my currency this is actually printing the currency code if I do not want the currency code let's say whenever I want to hit the pay bill button uh, whatever the currency code that the user has entered he will see the display name or the currency name right here and to do that I have already told you when I was doing the testing right here you can see I was using get display name okay so let me use this get display name method so what I can do I can copy this display name method okay and I'm going to use this display name method or get display name method over a currency object so let me close this test class and let me go to my result page and here I'll say build it your dot currency dot command V and I'll say display name here okay so if I write display name here it is automatically going to call the get display name okay so let me only say display name and let me remove the parenthesis it's not needed let me do a command s right now and let me go here let me go back and okay let me say inr right now and let me hit pay bill and you can see 20,000 Indian rupee okay let me go back again let me test it for uh, a u d and if i am going to hit the pay bill the amount 20000 australian dollar generated on this particular date so it's working good right now congratulations Okay, so before I wrap up this particular section on the property editor, I want to address some more thing on the property editor concept so that you guys will not have any confusion on this topic. So first of all, the first question will be, uh, look at the credit card number that I'm entering right here. So as I previously said, this is the string and to convert this string to the credit card type, I'm using a formatter here. Okay, and actually, if, we, if you see the credit card class, the pattern that I have here, I have four different properties called first four digits, just like that second, third, and the last four digits. And the way I am converting this user input to a credit card object by using a formatter. So if you have understood my last session on formatter, this is some pretty basic and pretty fundamental example and a very simple parse method I have written here to convert my string to a credit card object. So here you can see I'm creating the credit card object and then I'm setting all my credit card properties value right here. And finally, I'm returning the credit card instance right here. And if you see my config, my config file here, you can see I have overridden the add formatters method and here actually I am registering my credit card formatter. So previously I have discussed this particular concept, how to register a custom formatter with our application in my formatter tutorial, okay? But there is a, another way using what I can add a formatter to my application. Let me show you that. So let me comment this particular method, okay? So my oh, credit card formatter will not be registered with my application and which will create the problem during the data binding. So right now, if I'll go to my bill page, let's say the user is entering this credit card number, and if I'm doing pay bill, and you can see it is failing to convert the property, which is a string to the required credit card type. So right now, I can actually register this particular credit card formatter with my application by using the init binder method. Okay, there is a, another way to register our custom formatter with our application. And let me tell you that how we're going to do it. So to add a custom formatter with my application, what I can do here, I can say a binder, which is my web data binder instance. And I can say add formatter or add custom formatter. As you can see, I have a method here. And right here, I can define new credit card formatter. There you go. Let me save this application and let me test it out. 
So right now if I'll go to my application home page, let me hit the pay bill button again and you can see in this time the credit card binding works good. So I'm also able to register a formatter with my application using the init binder method. Okay, but now most probably you are asking me this particular question. Hey Vilash, you have written a credit card formatter and inside this formatter you have a parse method where you are taking a string and then you are splitting the string and after that once the splitting has been done you are actually fetching the value from the string array one by one and setting it to the credit card properties. So the way you solve this particular problem by using a formatter. So can we use a property editor? Don't you think the formatter and the property editor concept is pretty similar? Because in the formatter, we are taking a string and then we are returning the instance of a credit card. And using a property editor also, we can do the same kind of conversion. So let me test it out, whether I can use a property editor instead of a formatter. So to test this out, let me create a property editor for my credit card and let me use the property editor instead of the formatter. So let me create a new class and I'll say it credit card editor. Let me hit finish. And my credit card editor should extends to property editor support. And now I'll override the set as text method. And here I am going to do the exact same thing that I have did in my credit card class. So I'll go to my credit card formatter class and here I'll copy all the logic that I written. This is the logic that I have written and I'll copy this and I'll paste it inside my credit card editor class. And there you go. Okay. And here my set as text method is a void method. So once I have created my credit card object here, and once I have set all the properties of my credit card object, then I do not need to return this. Rather, I can call the set value method, which is the method inside the property editor support class. And here I can set the credit card object. Cool. So let me do command S to save it. And let me use this credit card editor instead of the credit card formatter and let's check whether the things are working fine. So first of all, let me go to the controller class. I will come in this line where I'm adding the custom formatter. And now I will use the custom editor instead of the formatter. So the editor class that I've created is credit card editor. So I can say credit card editor and I'll create the object of credit card editor. And let me add this editor to the binder. Cool. So I have created a credit card editor instance and I have registered it with my binder object. So now let me save this and let me wait till my server reload the changes so that I can test my application. Okay. So now let me test the application. I'll go to the bill page I'll go back and right now let me hit pay bill and you can see this is working fine okay so right now it is making sure that my credit card editor is working as expected and in this case I'm not using a formatter rather I'm using a credit card editor which is actually my property editor so now my goal is successful I just wanted to confuse you between the formatter and the editor. So these two are very similar concept, isn't it? And you should have a question in your mind that then what to choose? Either I'll choose the formatter or I'll choose a editor. What should I use? So before I go ahead and answer this question, I'll show you one more thing. Let's say if I'll come here to my, uh, to my application, if I'll go back and if I refresh the page, let me go back, refresh it. 
so all value will go so whenever i'm actually refreshing the page or whenever i'm actually loading this particular page let's say i need something some value inside the credit card during the page load let's say i want a conversion i have a credit card object that been paged from the database and i want to load that object or load that instance right here so how i'm going to get the value right here so in case of a formatter we basically use the print method and i have given you the example how to use the print method in the last video but let's say if we are not using the formatter and rather let me let me go to my package explorer let's say i'm not using the formatter in this case i'm only using a editor and in this case i'm using the credit card editor now you might question me that hey vilash okay i understand using the set as text method you can actually convert the string value to the credit card object but right now my intention is the reverse let's say i want to display a credit card number right here whenever this page loads so how to do this reverse stuff and for that we have a, another method so if i'll go to the credit card editor here we can override a, another method that is get as text right now this is set as text i can override a, another method called get as text i can say override this method and here actually you can see i can return a string okay so whenever i'm going to populate a credit card number right here this is going to be a string isn't it so if you're going to see the get as text method it is going to return you a string if you are going to see the set as text method here we are returning kind of returning a object okay and we are populating the object but right here during the page load we will be needing a string which will be populated here in our web page so let's say if i'm going to write here enter in this format okay let me save it and let me check when my page loads either i'm getting this string in my web page so let me go to the testing this particular page and let me refresh this and you can see this text here enter in this format okay let's say right now i do not want to enter this rather i want to give a sample card number okay or i want to load the user credit card number if it is already stored okay so what i can do if i'll go to the controller let's say where is my uh, where is my controller which is loading the bill page this is the page which is this one and in this controller and in this handler method before it returns the bill page let me create a dummy credit card object so i can say credit card credit card equal to new credit card and let me say credit card dot set first four digits and let me say one two three four and similarly let me set all the properties for my credit card object now right now let me add this credit card instance to my dto so i can say bill dto dot set credit card and i will add the credit card instance and there we go so i have set the credit card instance right here so now let me go to the credit card editor and here i need to return that particular credit card number that i have set inside my controller which is this one so if i'll go to the credit card editor here inside the get as text method the first question will be how i will get that object and to get that object i can use another method called get value and you can see this get value method is returning a object and this is from the property editor support class right so i can use the get value method to get the object that i'm getting in the controller or you can see inside the controller whatever the object that i have created and if this object even we are getting from a database operation or something if we have this object the way we can get the hold of it inside the editor by using the get value and as you know this get value is returning you the object as you can see so what i can do i can cast this get value with the 
credit card and I can store this with a credit card instance so credit card credit card equal to I'll get the credit card object here and right now let me remove this line and I can say sample and I can concatenate this with this credit card instance I can say credit card and I'll do command s and there we go so right now my expectation is that whenever I'm going to print my credit card reference it, this is actually going to print the number that I have set inside my test controller which is 1234-3456-7777-8888 and the reason why I am expecting that that's because if I'll go into the credit card and here if you're going to see the two string here I have written this first four digits then hyphen then second four digits this is my two string method okay so this is going to be exactly printed in that format so let me save everything and let me test my application cool so right now let me hit this URL or I can actually reload this particular page and boom sample credit card number is this okay so here actually we are converting the credit card if, if you go here to the controller we are converting the credit card object to if you are going to see in the editor we are converting the credit card object to a string and we are returning that and actually in the web page we are printing it right here so the property editor works in either way either you can convert to object to string or string to object which is best suitable for the data binding or specifically whenever you are working with a GUI or a web application Okay, so right now let's get back to our question again. Which one to use? Should I use a formatter? Just like the credit card formatter, where I'll have the print and parse method? Or should I use a property editor, where I'll have the get as text and the set as text method? And I'm sure you're getting confused which one to use. I have two different alternatives. In which scenario I have to use what? But hold on. I want to trouble you more. I will give you another one solution. And that solution is pretty latest and been introduced to Spring Framework in probably Spring 3.0 version. So that is called a converter, which is kind of an alternative to property editors. Let me tell you that property editors are still the best. They are being used widely in the Spring framework. Spring internally uses the property editor a lot. But there is another one. There is another alternative to it. And in my recent projects, I have used them a lot. That is called a converter. Now, let me create a converter for my credit card. And let me see whether my converter can do the exact same work for me. So whatever my credit card editor is doing right now, the set as text method and the get as text method, whatever the work they are doing right now, can a converter do the same work? So to make you understand this, what I can do, I can create a new package here and I can create a new class here. So let me create a new class and let me say this credit card converter. And let me hit finish here. So, okay, so let me let me actually uh, create a new package for converters. And let me drag this credit card converter to my converters package. Okay, so I have my credit card converter here. So what I can do, I can implement an interface to this particular class called converter. So I'll write converter here. And the one that I want to use is this one, 
org.springframework.core.convert.converter. So here, this particular converter need two things. What is the source and what is the target? Let's say I want to convert a string object, let's say string here, to a credit card object. So let me say credit card here. Okay, so I want to convert a string to the credit card object. So let me go back and let me implement the unimplemented methods. And here you can see I'm getting a convert method which is taking a string, okay, which is my source. This is gonna be my user input. And then I'm going to convert that string to credit card. Okay, so to do that, let me delete this. Again, let me go to my formatter. And here I'm going to copy the logic. I'll go to the credit card converter. And I'm going to paste the logic right here. So here, instead of saying text, I'm going to say source.split. And there you go. My credit card converter is ready. So you guys can have a look. I just have a convert method, which is going to take a string as a source. And here is actually I'm accepting the string. Then I am actually creating the credit card object here, setting the properties to my credit card object. And obviously, I need to return my credit card. Okay. And this is the instance that I have created. Okay, and I'm returning the credit card. And now only one thing I need to do, I need to register this particular converter. Okay, and to register it, if I'll go here to the test controller, inside the init binder method this time, I cannot actually register the converter. Okay, so to register the converter, again, we need to go to the configuration file of our application. And here we can uncomment this particular method of add formatters. And here I can remove this line and I can say registry, which is the instance of the formatter registry. And here actually I have a method called add converter. And my converter name is new credit card converter. This is the one that I have created recently. If I click here, Okay, so this is the converter I have created. So before I test my application, I'll do one more thing. I'll go to my controller and here I will comment this credit card editor so that I can make sure right now my credit card converter is working. So here you can have a look inside the init binder method. Nowhere I'm registering my credit card formatter or nowhere I'm registering my credit card editor. You can see these lines are commented out. The formatter lines is also commented out. So now let's check whether my converter is working or not. Cool. So let me go to my web page. Let me do a refresh. So this is the value that we are getting. That's because we have set this value inside our controller right here. Okay. So now let me do what I will change this number. Let's say 9977. And let me say three, two, four, five. And let's say amount is $20, 20, let's say 20 AUD and the date is 01, 01, Okay. And let's say pay bill and boom, it's working good. So here, basically I'm using a converter instead of a editor. Okay. So here my converter is working really, really good. But hold on, I'll tell you one last thing. Might be you take it as a disadvantage. The disadvantage, you can say it, if you're going to go to the property editor, and if you're going to look at the credit card editor here. So here you can see, whenever we are extending to the property editor support, here we are actually getting the getest text, which is pretty beneficial for the base load time when we're actually converting the credit card object to a string and we're returning the string here. And also we have a set as text where actually we're accepting a string and then we're returning the credit card object back. Okay, so here we have two different method, but whenever we're actually creating a converter, so now here what we are doing, we are accepting a string, 
okay then we're giving a object back right now let's say I have a reverse requirement I have a requirement that the same requirement I have given previously let's say here I want to let me go back here I want to say sample credit card number then I can say this then how I'm going to do it so here my requirement is I'm going to accept the string okay then I'm going to manipulate the string and I'm going to give it back to the web page so whenever the user is going to load the page he is going to get the string right here so how I'm going to deal with that so when we're dealing with the formatter we have the print method okay so whenever we're dealing with the editor we have the get as text method but what about the converter so do we have something just like that and I'll say unfortunately no so in order to achieve the same requirement you need to create a another converter here so what I can do I can create another class and I can say again credit card converter I can say object to string just to make it understandable I'm giving this particular name here let me hit finish and here again I need to implement the converter and this time my source is going to be credit card and my target is going to be string then again I'm going to override the unimplemented method and here what I can do in this source I'll be getting the credit card value and I'll say return sample plus and I can print the source here the source is exactly going to be the credit card object that I'll be getting right here so I can have a full control on this object right here inside the credit card converter object okay so if I want I can only show source dot get first four digits if I want I only can print the first four digits okay so the thing that I want to show you right here is that I have a complete control over this credit card object which is my source object right now and the way I want to deal with it I can deal with it okay so let me do command s and let me see whether I'm getting this sample and this much uh, right here in my web page so now let me reload this particular page and let's see whether I'm getting the text right here and you can see I'm not getting the text that I have set here and the reason is pretty simple this is a new converter that I have created so I need to register it and let me check whether this converter is working right now let me go to the testing and let me hit the URL and you can see sample one two three four whatever the thing that I'm returning right here inside this convert method so take a note of it if you want to use the converter interface for each conversion you need to write a new converter just like here for credit card we ended up writing two converter one is for object to string and another for string to object cool so this is one of the benefits that we are having whenever we are dealing with the editors as we have both the get as text and the set as text method Welcome to a new section and in this section we are going to talk about Spring MBC validators but we are not going to use the Hibernate API or we are also not going to use the bin validation API we are going to use the Spring MBC I'm sorry the Spring Frameworks validation API okay we are going to create some form validators using the Spring's own validation API and I'm going to give you a couple of examples I'm going to code something by myself and also I'm going to give you some assignments right now so first of all uh, let's see some scenarios but the condition is we are not going to use the bin validation API we are going to use the Spring's validation API 
Let's go for it. Okay, so here is a scenario. Let's say I want to develop some validation constraint for the username. So the criteria that I want to give you for this constraint is that the username cannot be empty. This is the first criteria. And the second criteria should be, uh, let's say if, let's say the name should be something like Abhilas Panikrahi and the username something like, let's say user underscore Abhilas, okay? So the second requirement will be, this string should contains a underscore. If the underscore is not provided by the user in the string, then you should give a validation message to the user. So there are two requirements. The first should contain an underscore. Second uh, should not be null, right? This should not be null. Okay, so now if I'll go to the DTO uh, of this particular page, let's say star DTO again. Let me go to the user registration DTO. Uh, so we need to develop the constraint for this particular field, okay? So uh, the first thing is that, okay, it should not be null. So if we would have used the JSA 303 or 380 annotation, we can use something like this right here. At not empty, we can write here, or we can also give a not blank annotation before it, and it would have worked and prevent the user to submit the form without the username value, but we cannot do that, right? So right now, we need to, create a custom validator without using the JSA 303 or 380 API. And now let's see an, another approach right here to create a custom validator. And I'm going to create a new class for that. And let me name this class as uh, user name validator. And to convert this class as a validator class, I need to implement an interface. There's probably an interface called validator. So we should be having an interface called validator, which is coming from org.springframework.validation. Make sure that you are going to use this interface and this validator interface is provided by the Spring framework, okay? So make sure you're going to choose this one and then go ahead and finish this. Cool, so we got a class here called username validator. Okay, so you can see that right now, whenever we are implementing the validator interface to to the custom validator that we are creating, we have to basically override these two methods. One is called supports method and one is called a validate method. So in short, if, I, if I'm going to maximize this, here inside the validate method, we need to write our custom validation logic, okay? And here inside the supports method, here we need to check whatever the logic that we are writing here, this is for which object, okay? So check if the validator support a given object, okay? The first thing I'm gonna do here in the return statement, I'm gonna return what? For which object I'm writing this validator? I'm writing this validator for this user registration class, right? User registration DTO. So what I can do, I can go there and I can write user registration DTO dot class dot equals the object provided by this supports method, right? So this class, I can write this class. This should be equals to our user registration DTO. we are going to see it in practically when we're going to debug it, right? You are going to see when this particular method is getting called. But in short, this is just going to check on which object we are writing this particular validator or does our validator can validate this particular object, right? The user registration DTO object. Okay, so the next thing is that once we confirm here that we are going to validate the user registration DTO object, then we can write our validation logic right here. My first requirement was to check if the field is null, right? If null, we need to reject it. So the way we are going to solve it by using a utility class provided by Spring Framework. And the class name is, if I'm correct, the class name is validation utils. And observe here that this is a Spring Framework class, right? Org the Spring Framework 
dot validation okay using this class let me give some white spaces here okay and using this class here there are, there are some utility methods uh, see here just like reject if empty or reject if empty or white space so let me use one of this particular method called reject if empty or white space so it is going to reject the form whenever there will not be any value provided by the user right here if this will be empty or if somebody is giving white space then this particular class that i'm writing here inside this username validator this particular method is going to reject it if there is no value in the text box or if only the white space provided to the text box okay so the first thing is that there are four arguments right here as you can see first we are passing errors this is the error instance that we'll be getting through the validate method argument okay from where we'll be getting it from where i'll be calling it and i'll be showing you that from where i'll be passing this particular object and how i can use this object okay so now i don't think it's a good time to tell you about this but i am going to show you in few minutes okay so first object that i need to pass here inside the reject if empty or white space method is going to be this errors instance that i'll be getting through this validate method okay so the next argument will be is going to be the field name which field i am validating here i am actually validating the user registration dto class username field right so let me copy this let me go back and let me paste it the next method is going to be the error code so i can give my custom error code right here so i can write anything here but let me give a valid error message let me say that username i can say it only username but let me give username dot empty okay and if the username will be empty then what is the default error message you want to provide okay so you can actually provide your error message right here or you can load it from the properties file first of all let me provide the error message right here and then we are going to load it from the properties file now okay. let me say username cannot be empty okay so let me save this and right now let me check whether the things are working so i'll provide a breakpoint here in the line number 15 and i'll provide a breakpoint in the line number 23 uh, and i'll go to let me go to the debug perceptives right now and let me remove all these breakpoints right now first of all let me remove all okay i'll say yes now come back to the spring perceptives i'll put a breakpoint here in the line number 23 and i'll put a breakpoint line number 15 i just want to make sure whenever these particular methods are getting called and i'll do command shift f so right now if you see here we are successfully created our username validator and now our username validator is just checking if the given field is empty or only the white space is provided to our text boxes if yes then it is going to reject the value and it is going to generate this error code and it is going to give this default message that hey username cannot be empty so now we have created our username validator the next thing we need to learn that where we are going to register it and the place we are going to register it is inside the controller inside which controller we are going to apply this validator obviously we are going to apply this validator inside the user registration controller now we can do what so before the data binding happens right here inside the registration success method and before the form values are assigned to this particular dto object what i'm going to do i'm going to the init binder method because my flow is going to come here first and what i can do here i can create validator object for for me it is user name validator validator equal to new username validator and i can do binder dot i'm going to add a validator with this reference called add validator there is a method and here i'm going to provide my validator object for me my validator object is here i've created the username validator object i can do control c and control v here and that's it or you can do what you do not need to create separately the object you can just write here you can do a new username validator and there you go cool and i'm going to put a breakpoint here in the line number 89 and i'm going to activate all my breakpoints i'm going to save all my files 
and let me start the application in debug mode okay so now it's destroying and initializing and adding the formatters doing all the formalities and is completed the reloading completed now let me go to the registration page right here and let me test this application so first of all let's say right here i have the name and for the username i am not providing anything let's say and i am doing register uh, right now the flow came already to my init binder method and if i'm going to see here you can see i am inside the init binder method and in my init binder method right now i'm adding this validator called username validator let me do f8 so that it is going to go to the next breakpoint okay so let me do resume this particular program and now you see i am inside the supports method that i have retained for my username validator class okay and right here if i if i put my cursor you can see i got a user registration dto object right here and here i am checking where i am going to apply this particular validator right now here user registration dto dot class dot equals and i am passing this class object right here this is going to definitely going to return true if i do command shift i inspect element you can see i'm getting true right here okay so this confirms that right now my validation could be applied to this particular object called user registration dto now let me hit f6 or i can simply resume this particular program so that the next breakpoint will be executed and you can see right now the validate method is getting executed so now as the validation supports here okay so my validate method is getting executed because i can validate the username property of my user registration dto class simple right and right now obviously my validation will fail here because i have not given any particular value right here in the username so if i'll go to my username validator and if i'm going to resume this particular program okay i can show you one more thing i can go to my controller right now and in my controller also let me give a breakpoint here in the line number 51 and now let me go to my username validator and let me resume the program so the flow will come to here to the next breakpoint and now obviously my form has error so if i'll do f6 again and now if i'll do f6 here again you can see i came into the if clause again because my form has error and this particular result that has error is true this result where i'm getting this result this result is this binding result right so if i'll put my crosser here you can see this binding result does have a property called error okay and if you see this errors right now you can already see i'm getting a rejection value okay i'm getting a rejection value for age right now because i have also not provided the age in my form which is a mandatory field and if i'll go again if i'll slide again you can also see another field error for the username field called username rejection value right here you are getting and the code is username.empty whatever i have given and then a pattern created by the spring user registration user age this is my model attribute object and then the username which is my field name and for this i should have a default error message which is username cannot be empty so what you understand from here is that whatever the error i am sending there if i'll go to my username validator here you can see i'm sending an error right i i'm posting this error okay and where i'm posting this particular error this error is going to be reported to if i'll go to the controller this error is reporting to this particular result and here inside this result i am getting my custom error that i have binded or that i am reporting to the binding result which is this one user cannot be empty okay this is the thing i'm reporting from the username validator from here to here okay and that's how i can keep track right here in my controller method by using the binding result result reference and i can have checks right here if the result has errors and if it has errors then i'm going to simply return the user registration page to them okay so let me do f6 if i'll go here again the timeout issue let me skip all the breakpoints and before i rerun it again what i can do i can go to my jsp page which is user registration dot jsp and right here inside this particular page for the username 
this is my username right for this i need to add a form errors and the path should be username and also let me add the css class to this and let me hit command s and let my changes get reloaded to my server and right now i can go to the user registration page i can give a value days for now let's say 35 okay but this one is empty let me do register so am i getting some error and you can see username cannot be empty okay and right now i'm not using any kind of custom validator using the jsr 303 rather i'm creating my custom validator here by using a interface called validator which is coming from the spring framework okay so that's great so the next thing that i'm going to do here is my second constraint or the second criteria that i have given to you the second criteria i have given is if the user let's say if the user is providing only obhilas and if he is not providing a underscore value right here i should reject that form okay and i'll tell the user to submit again but right now if i'll be hitting register you can see i'm going to the next page but i need to stop it i should not allow the user to come to the next page and the way i'm going to do it is actually i'll go to the username validator and if the username string doesn't contain a underscore we need to reject it okay and for that we will not find any kind of predefined method inside the validation utils class so here we need to write our own logic first of all i am getting this object here right this target i can say it object okay and whatever the object that i'll be getting i can type cast this particular object to my user registration dto object because i am sure that if the flow is coming to this particular validate method i am getting a user registration dto object because here the supports method confirms that my supports method confirms that that hey the object that you are getting is the user registration object so what i'll do i can blindly take this object i can copy this and i can take this object and this object i'm going to type cash to the user registration dto object and from this user registration dto object i am going to get the username so i'll do dot get username and now this username is going to return me a string whatever the string that user entered so what i'll do i'll do string user name and once i get my username right here what i'll do i will write a if clause right if this string username dot contains a underscore so what i'm going to check if my string is not containing this underscore what i'll do i'll do errors i'll take my errors object right here i'll do errors dot reject or i can say reject value errors dot reject value this error is going to report to the binding result in the controller as i said and the field name is again going to be the username so let me do copy paste here the field name the error code i can give the error code again as username but i'll say username dot invalid i can say invalid string i can say anything but let me say invalid string and then i can give a default error message string should contain a underscore string must contain a underscore let me say and let me save all this thing and now let me activate all my breakpoint i want to see it what is happening behind the scene i will go back and i will actually go back again so that i'll get my register page i'll have a valid as here and for the username let me say avilash and i will not give a underscore right here and let's say avilash panigrahi uh, i should be writing something like avilash underscore panigrahi this is a valid input but i'll not be giving that underscore right here and let me hit register i'll go to the debug perceptives i'll say yes i am inside my init binder method let me resume let me go to the next breakpoint i am here inside the supports 
Uh, so if I will go again, my supports method obviously supporting the user registration DTO, this is some kind of framework class. I don't want to execute this thing so that I can resume my program. It will go to the next breakpoint. And here inside the validate method, right now let me do F6. And now here, let me do another F6 again so that I'll get my username right here. Here called Avilas Panigrahi, this is the value that I have entered for my username box and I'm capturing it right here. So the typecasting happens pretty good because if you see for the object, the object is user registration DTO, okay? So object is the super class. Object can store any kind of class in Java, right? We can write object obj equal to any kind of class because object is the parent for every classes in Java, right? That's why I can happily typecast this object to my user registration DTO again. And from this, from this user registration DTO, I can get the username. And once I get the username, I'm storing the username here. And right now I'm checking whether the username dot contains a underscore value, right? Obviously this is going to be false. If I'll do command set I, this is going to be false. And right now you can see I'm putting a not right here. So false not is true. So it will go into this if block right now the value is true. So it will go here again. And now adding a rejected value to my errors called username dot invalid string. This is going to be the key and the message is this and this is for the field called username. So if I'll do a resume again, it will go to my controller method. Right now, if I'll put my crosser here in the result, you can see the errors here. And if I'll go to the error, you can see I have only one error, I think. Yes. And the error is user registration object got a field error for username and the error code is whatever username that invalid string dot user registration, which is my DTO object. And if I'll go here, it has a default message called string must contain a underscore value. Okay. So right now, let me, uh, let me do what? Let me step over. It will go to the if clause step over. Okay. Now, now uh, the for loop will be executed. My message will be printed inside the console. And now again, if I'll do two step over, this particular page will be shown or displayed. Let me do resume. Okay, again, the timeout issue. Okay, I'm going to solve this timeout issue this time uh, once I once my debug is completed, right? So what I can do, I can disable my breakpoints for now. I can go to the string perceptives and right now, let me hit register and you can see string must contain a underscore. So let me give a underscore right here register and you can see right now I'm successfully able to submit the form. If I'll go back, if I will not give anything, I should get two error messages. Yes, I'm getting two error messages here. One is for empty, one is it is not containing underscore. The next thing I can try, I can give some empty spaces. I'll do register again, I'll get two error messages because empty space is also not allowed for my username, okay? So make sure you have something with underscore, then only this will be passed, okay? Hope it clears your confusion. Okay, so before I wrap up this section, I want to show you one more scenario. Let's say uh, if you want to write a constraint validator for this email field. And let's say I'm giving you a business criteria that only allow the email which has a domain name called seleniumexpress.com. The email should have a domain called seleniumexpress.com. I'll just show you an example. Let's say abhilash at the rate selenium express.com okay so this is a valid email if the user does have something else just like uh, gmail.com then this is not a valid email so how i can validate this kind of stuff okay
So for that what I can do again I can go to my Java resources and sorry uh, source main Java and here inside the validator what is the last validator I have created username validator okay so what I can do I can just similarly create a different validator uh, let's say class and obviously my class name is going to be email validator okay and I should add the interface called validator again coming from spring framework I'll do finish cool so I got my support method here and I got my validate method so inside the support method again I should check whether the object I am receiving here is exactly the object that I'm going to apply my email validator so this email validator I'm writing for, if I'll go to the DTO, uh, in my user registration DTO, I have a communication DTO. If I'll go into that, I have the email and phone and I'm writing this for this email field, okay? So here is the pattern, right? Inside the user registration DTO, I have the communication DTO. This is the reference. And then inside this, I have the email, right? So the path, to this email is gonna be communication DTO dot email okay so what I can do right now first of all uh, this is the object that I'm looking for let me copy this let me go to email validator and here again I'll be checking user registration DTO dot class dot equals class whatever the object I'll be getting here I'll check whether it supports that and once yes I can write my logic here again I can write validation util dot reject if empty or white space first I'm going to report the errors whatever I'm getting here then the field my field will be just see that pattern okay so the pattern will be communication DTO copy command C to copy and I'll go to the email validator and command V to paste dot email okay then the error code let's say the error code will be email dot empty and after that here let me break this line here I need to provide my custom error message let's say email cannot be blank okay so rather what I can do I will not provide the custom error message right here so I'll do command X okay let me take this message from here and let me load it from a property file okay so where is my property file inside the resources folder messages.properties and here let me provide my properties right here let me remove the string and this property uh, this message is for the key what is the key that I've given there my key is this one email dot empty this is the key error code right so I'm going to copy paste my error code right here and that's it okay so now uh, let me check that if I'll go here uh, things are looking good email cannot be empty my first criteria fulfills here and the next thing here I'm going to check whether the email is ending with selenium express.com okay it should have this domain so what I can do again I can get my email field or I can capture the email field from this target object I'll take this object command C command V and I'll typecast this object to the user registration DTO command C command V so I'm converting the object to user registration DTO type and over that I am going to call get communication DTO and over get communication DTO I'm going to get the email okay once I get the email let me store it with a string let's say string email and let me check here if email dot 
ends with uh, seleniumexpress.com if my string is ending with this is not true then I am going to give a validation message I'm going to reject the form so I'll say errors dot reject value let me use this method the fill name is again going to be communication DTO dot email then the error code error code is let's say email dot invalid domain and the default error message uh, let me get the default error message from, from the properties file so let me remove this and let me copy the key command C here let me go to the properties file for email invalid domain I'll give an error message here let's say email should be ending with seleniumexpress.com okay and let me make it caps email okay now let me save all these files and now let me test this out okay one thing I forgot to do that is I need to register my validator the validator that I have created right here so this is the validator that I have created and I need to register it in my init binder method okay uh, let me tell you that the logic that I have written inside this validate method is not that robust okay I can easily break this logic but well this is just for uh, showing you this particular pattern how you're going to write it so later on we're going to fix this one and we're going to improve this particular logic Cool. So right now, let me go to the registration page and let me do a register here. Okay, there is some overlapping happening right here, but I am getting this error message. You can see email should be ending with at the rate seleniumexpress.com. So let me change this to seleniumexpress.com register and now okay string must contain a underscore so let me give a underscore right here and let me try to register it and boom I am able to go to the next page but now let me fix this one this issue uh, if uh, it is not seleniumexpress.com let's say gmail.com right now uh, this particular thing is overlapping on this so let me give a br after this phone Okay, so this is all about creating the custom validators by using the Spring Framework validator interface. Uh, and we are calling all these things right here using uh, the init binder method and we're registering it using the binder. Okay, and if you want to manually call these methods also, you can do it. Let me show you an example. This is the last thing I'm going to show you right here. Let me comment this one for the email validator. Let me not add the email validator right here. Also, you can do what you can come to our process user registration method here we have a couple of log uh, here we are printing the name okay and also we have a, another printer line right here let me control exit let me keep the printer line right here I want this should be my first line inside process user registration method and after that I have my debug purpose line here just to track I have created it and now I want to show you that how you can call uh, this email validator 
from your controller methods, right? So simply you can do what? You can create object, right? You can create email validator object, email uh, validator, uh, validator equal to new email validator. And you can simply do validator dot validate the target is going to be my DTO object. Let me pass it right here. And for the errors, what is my uh, binding result reference result? Let me copy this and let me paste it here. Okay. And now let me save all these things and let me check whether the things are working fine or not. Cool. So now let me test it out. Let me go to the registration page and let's say I am giving selenium express.com right here. Let me click on register. Well, I'm able to go to the next page. Right now, uh, let me uh, give something else. Let's say xyz.com. Let me do a register. And okay, my validation fails, right? Okay, so there is an, another way to call your validator method right here. Just by creating the email validator object manually, and you need to send your DTO object and the result object to your validate method, which is this one. And there is one more way actually, uh, people do it a lot in their real time project. They do what? They do what? If you'll go to a controller here, you are actually creating the email validator object by yourself, right? So they, they do not want it. They do not create objects just like this. Rather, they give the control to Spring to create the object. So to do that, what they do, if you'll go to your validator class, email validator, they will just annotate this particular class with add component and the spring will create the object for this email validator class and it will keep this object inside the container. So what I need to do here inside the uh, registration controller, I do not need to create objects just like this. Let me remove this and what I can do, let me do command G. I can before removing, let me remove this part. Okay. And let me do command X. Let me go all the way to top and right here, let me paste it. Let me declare this variable right here. Let's say private email validator validator and I will just auto add it. Okay. Cool. So right now I am creating the object right here. So if we we'll go to the email validator class, I have given the add component. So spring is going to create the object for this particular class. Okay, so here inside my controller, I am just creating the validator reference or so the email validator reference. I am not doing equal to new email validator right here. Whenever we are creating an email validator, whenever we're giving add component annotation, Spring is going to create this particular object. And right here inside the controller, we will not do it because Spring has already created that object and we are using at auto word so that Spring will inject that object whatever the object spring has created for email validator spring will inject that new email validator or that object to this particular validator reference okay and now i can take this command c and i'll go all the way to down and here i can do command v validator dot validate okay here i am calling the email Okay, let me change this validator to email validator. That will be good. Uh, that will be good for understanding. I'll say email validator. Okay, this is a good variable name. Let me copy this. Let me go all the way to down. And here I'll do email validator dot validate and calling the email validator method. Okay, cool. So right now that's pretty fine. My things should work good right now. But before that, I want to check one more thing, my component scanning. So this email validator, this particular class is present in which package? So if I'll do link to editor, this is present inside com.seleniumexpress.lc.validator. And if I'll open my app config file right now, if I'll go to the config folder, and if I'll open my uh, love calculator app config, what is the component scan? com.seleniumexpress.lc.controllers. Okay, uh, so what I can do here, I can actually give a comma and I can define another package name. 
and why I am getting an error here this because this is going to accept an array so let me give a curly brace right here cool looking good so right now what I can do I can go to my registration page and now let me do register okay it's failing now it let me give selenium express.com register well I'm able to go to the next page okay so the things are working fine but there is a small thing that I want to show you right now if I'll go to the love calculator f config class now here you can see right now I'm specifying the base package by putting the packages name right here okay let's say controllers package name is there and the validator package right now is here because for the validator package also I am using the add component annotation so instead of giving the package name just like this if I have 100 package name I should not give it for 100 time rather what I can do you can see if I'll go to the project explorer and right now here if you'll see if I will collapse everything let me open spring love calculator java resources source main java c this is the main package right com.seleniumexpress.lc and inside this I have sub packages like API, config, controllers, formatter, validator, property editor and etc. So what I can do I can use the sub package name so I will remove the controllers from this and I'll remove everything let me remove everything from this and I am just going to use com.seleniumexpress.lc okay com.seleniumexpress.lc is my main folder name and after that all these are subfolders so I'm going to use this root folder name and after that all these sub packages are coming under these so I do not need to specify all these things right here so let me test this again whether this is working fine or not So this particular page is loading that means in my application config file my controllers my controller is getting initialized so my component scan is also working for my controller handler method and also I'm able to use this particular class so this confirms that this error message confirms that my validation is also working fine that means my, my component scanning for the validator is also working fine so this particular sub package stop worked okay this worked well cool this is an another concept and I hope that you guys are right now understanding the pretty core way to develop a spring application and you are doing really really good I'm really impressed that you are sticking till now and you are listening to me pretty carefully and I hope that I am not boring you guys and you guys are uh, learning something you guys are getting something and uh, cooperate me <laughs> I'll be able to transfer the knowledge that I want to share, okay? Okay guys, so before I wrap up this tutorial, one last thing I want to cover and that's going to be about the placeholder inside our properties file. So if you see here, let me collapse everything. If I will go to the spring love calculator inside the source main resources we have messages dot properties and right here we can use placeholders to load this lower value this upper value uh, let's say the age is the variable name email is the variable name all these things we can dynamically load rather hard coding them okay let me tell you how and you're going to see a lot of scenario like this whenever you're going to work in a live application for sure okay so first of all let me do a work let me open the user registration DTO here I'm using the not empty okay and here I'm giving the message right so let me uh, copy this message command C and let me paste this message right here let me remove the double quote and let me say string dot not empty okay let's say this is gonna be my property name that I am giving right here and this is the value this is the key let me copy the key command C and let me place the key right here in my user registration DTO and I can keep this curly brace inside the double quote and let me paste the key here and uh, here I can do cannot be empty let me say custom 
just to make sure this is a custom error message okay and let me save this and now let me test the application so now if i'll go to the home page and if i'll go to the register url enter and let's say i'm hitting the register button without putting anything and you can see star cannot be empty custom so this makes sure that this particular you know error messages is getting loaded okay so let me remove the custom from here and let me tell you about the placeholder let's say here uh, what is my field name my field name is name okay i should say name cannot be empty okay and if i save it and test it again right here let me hit register and you can see name cannot be empty okay so instead of hard coding this name here okay this name i have written it manually right instead of hard coding this name here i can directly load the variable name for an example in the user registration dto you can see the variable name is name okay so i need to load this name right here in my properties file and to do that i can do what i can give a placeholder here called zero and that's it now let me save this and let me test it again let's see whether my name is getting loaded right here or not so i'll go to the registration page and i'll do register cool you can see this name variable name is automatically getting loaded and right now the name is starting from a small n okay this is making sure that if you'll go to the registration dto this name is getting dynamically loaded right here okay so now let me do a, another changes for this edge so if you see the edge here this particular edge i am loading it from this particular properties file so this is the error message edge should be between lower and upper and this edge for this edge i can also use a placeholder called zero okay so let me save it and if i'll go to the registration page and if i'll do register look at this edge here now if i'll do register now you can see this age variable name is getting printed right here okay but this should not be just like that right instead of age instead of printing the variable name right here okay we can also customize that and how can you do that let's say if your company is using placeholder inside the properties file and also you have followed the same pattern and you have used the placeholder just like this inside the property file but whenever you are loading dto properties dynamically like this the variable name is getting printed right here just like name and age and you do not want it let's say you want to customize this okay you want to say user age should be between 33 and 70 then how you can make it if you are using placeholder just like this for the age you have used the placeholder like zero but here is the requirement you do not want age to be printed here you want user age right here then how you're going to do it and to do that first thing you are going to do you need to go to your dto so what is the property you are going to customize this age one right so let me copy the variable name i will go to the messages.properties and right here i'll say age equal to and i can say what is my customized value i can say user age okay so whenever you will find this particular age replace it with user age right so let me save it and let me check what kind of changes it is going to make whenever we are going to display it so now let's go to the registration page and look at this age here if i do register cool user age should be between 33 and 70 For this edge also, we are giving the validation value between 33 and 70. And if you see here, inside my user registration DTO, uh, this is my custom annotation that I have created. And the lower value is 33 and the upper value is 70. So dynamically, I want to face the lower and upper value. That's why I have written here lower and upper. But how about if you are trying to use some placeholder? So you may think this is zero, then it should be one I can put and here I can put two. Now let's see what is the result we are going to have. Let me save it. So my expectation is uh, the zero should be going to be my variable name and that variable name I have customized it. One should be my lower value and two should be my upper value 
and I should be getting my lower and upper value from here, which is 33 and 70. Okay, so let me go to the registration page and let me do a register. And you can see it is working fine. Pretty simple, right? So the lower and upper value has been replaced by one and two placeholder. Cool. So now as you understand this, let me give you an another scenario and please try to solve the scenario by using the concept that I given right here by using the placeholder. So let me go to the user registration DTO and where I have used the size annotation. Uh, okay. So let me go to the other DTO that I was using for my home page. So let me say DTO and let me go to the user info DTO. Let me go here. And now here you can see I have used the size annotation. So let's say I do not want to hardcore my message right here. Rather, I am going to provide a key here. So to provide a key, I can give braces right here. And here I can say username dot size. And this is going to be my key. Let me say copy and I'll go to the messages dot properties. And here for the username dot size, I can say the name should be between then I need to dynamically lower the minimum and the maximum value, right? So if I'll go to the user info DTO and here the minimum value is three and the maximum value is 15. So I can directly use mean and max, right? So let me go to the messages that properties. It should be between, I can say mean and I can give max here. Characters I can say. And let me also write here custom so that you can understand that this is loading from my properties file whatever I have written here right now. So let me save everything and let me test it out and after that I'm going to give you a scenario to solve okay and you need to solve the scenario by using exactly this particular formula okay. So now let me go to the user registration page let me go to my home page so I can go to the root URL and right now let me do a calculate okay this particular page is not responsive so let me uh, minimize this and you can see name should be between 3 and 15 characters custom. This is making sure that we are getting our message loaded from here. So now let me remove this custom from here. But now the problem that you are going to solve is I need to use placeholder right here. Okay. For a name, for minimum, for maximum. Okay. So you may think I will give zero here. Then if we'll go with the same formula, I'll give one here and I'll give two here. Correct. Let me save all and let me see what is going to happen. Okay. So now let's check whether our things are working fine. So in our user info DTO, the minimum size is three. The maximum is 15. So I'll go to the home page. And previously it was between three and 15 characters right here. Now let me do calculate. See here. What the heck is this? Now it is saying username. This is obviously my property name in my user info DTO. The username is username. Cool. So it is loading my properties name right there. Then it is saying it should be between 15 to three characters. Why it is reversing it? Uh, so what's the problem? My placeholder is not working in this scenario. The way it is worked for this, it didn't work for this one. So if we we'll go to my user info DTO, the property name is username. Let me copy this. Let me go to the properties file and I can say username is equal to your name. Correct? Because here this is your name. So I can say your name should be between this, this characters. Okay. So let me save all. Cool. So now the problem is how we are going to solve this issue. Why they're saying 15 and 3. So we are doing everything right. We are uh, making it 1 and 2 here. So what I can do, I can reverse it and can try again 2 and 1. Okay, so let me reverse this and let me do save all. Okay, so I can go to the home page right now. Look at here right now it's saying 15 and 3. Let me do calculate 
and it is saying right now 3 and 15 which is perfect. Now you may ask me, I will ask, what is the reason behind it? Why we need to write in this manner 2 here and 1 here? Okay, so the reason why we're writing 2 here first and the 1 here next, that's because spring is by default sorting our properties that we have inside our user info DTO size method, which is this one, mean and max here, it is actually sorting it. And based on the sorting, it is actually loading the value. So mean and max, we need to sort, right? So if I go to my properties file, if I write here mean, if I write here max, so max should come before mean. So here we should have the 0th value, but with the 0th one is already occupied here. So we need to give it one. And after max, after MA, MI will come. So I'll do two here, okay? And that's what I'm doing. For mean, I'm writing two here. And for max, I'm writing one here, okay? So this is just sorting this mean and max right here. And dynamically, we are trying to lower the value right here. And in this way, we have to use the placeholder in our properties file. And if you want to customize the data, if you want to customize your properties name, then you can do it by using key value pair just like this. Cool, but there is another time whenever our application is going to fail as well. So let me show you that thing also, right? That is called the type mismatch problem. So let me go to my home page and let me go to my user registration page. And here, let's say for age, I should be giving some value just like 45, okay? But let me give some value like some string right here. Now what is going to happen? If you're going to see this edge, okay, if I'll go to my user registration DTO, let me close this user info DTO, let me go to the user registration DTO, here the value is integer for edge, for the edge type is integer, right? But I am trying to entering some string, so it cannot be bind, the string cannot be binded with the integer, obviously, right? So it is going to give me some number format exception probably, so let me do one thing, uh, let, I think everything is saved. Now let me go here and let me do register. And you can see the problem. Failed to convert property of type string, java.lang.string to the required type, which is java.lang.integer for the property edge. And obviously it is giving you a number format exception, okay, for this particular string. And if you're going to see the log here, you can see for the age, there is a rejected value. Uh, that's because for the type mismatch and this is for the user registration property. And inside this, we have this age property, uh, which is belong to this user registration DTO object. And spring right here is generating some kind of error format, just like type mismatch dot age or, or the type mismatch dot dava dot lang dot integer, okay. So what I can do, I can copy one of this. I can copy one of this error code. I can copy this type mismatch dot java dot lang dot integer. If any kind of type mismatch things will happen, I can specify that right here. I can say if type mismatch dot java dot lang dot integer, if this is going to happen, I can give error message should be a number, okay? So let me save this and now let me test it again. Let me go to the registration page, okay? And right now, the same form I'm going to submit again and look at this particular property right here. Cool, so should be a number. And this is how we need to handle the type mismatch problem. And also you can go ahead and you can customize this kind of error message if you want to specifically write an error message for the age field, okay? Now you can see, if you see in the log, this is the rejection message for the age field. First, it is going to search for type mismatch dot user registration dot age. This is specific for the age, this error code. 
And I told you previously, first spring is going to look for this, then spring is going to look for type mismatch.is, and then if it is not going to find the error code for this, then it is going to look for some generic error, just like type mismatch.java.line.integer, whether any specific message is defined for this. If not, if any specific message is defined for only type mismatch, okay? So right now I have used this key previously for the integer. So in my application anywhere, if I'll get a type mismatch for the integer field, I'll be getting this should be a number. But let's say, and I want to specifically write error message for the is, so I can copy this property. I can go here and here I can paste it again. And I can say here, is should be a number. So now let's see which one we're going to get. We're going to get s should be a number, which is specifically for the age field, or we're going to get should be a number, which is kind of generic for uh, the type mismatch error for the integer field. Cool, so if we'll go here, right now see previously we have star should be a number, right now let me do register, and we got a should be a number, okay? So right now, as we have a specific message for this, this particular key type mismatch user dot registration and as spring is going to look for this particular key first. So this is the error message which is getting printed. But obviously, if you are going to comment this out, then spring is going to print this one as it is going to look for this particular key uh, after this particular key, right? Right here. Cool, so this is how you can handle the type mismatch problem in your application. Okay, so congratulations for completing this particular session. And obviously, we are going to learn a lot of new things in the next video. And I'm going to come up with some of the very interesting topic. And also we are going to build our service layer in the next video. And our job for the next video will be, we are going to make this application work, okay? So we need to write the service layer. And also I'm going to talk about the exception handling in the next video. And uh, the goal here is to wrap up everything. Obviously I'm going to make a long video, but the goal here is to wrap up everything and we are going to get started with the database stuff in the next to next video okay so a lot of good things in the store uh, hopefully you are excited and hopefully you're going to practice all these things and you're going to come back stronger okay so see you in the next video till then bye bye take care happy coding don't forget to like if you like this video don't forget to subscribe should i say that i don't know but whatever if you want if, if you if you are liking this videos and if you want to stay tuned with this particular channel do subscribe and follow me on instagram if you want to get updated uh, with my you know tutorials courses and all these things right my insta id is abhilas underscore panigrahi no it's selenium underscore express and also do not forget to like my facebook page which is selenium express and also join the selenium express support facebook group if you if you have an issue or if you want to ask me some questions so i'll see you in the next video till then take care